Hi everybody, welcome back to Environmental Organic Chemistry with Dr. Lisa. Uh, today we're going to do uh, a problem from the textbook, problem 7.3. Uh, so this is a problem concerning uh, partitioning of a chemical between water and different organic solvents. So this is actually, I like this problem because it's very practical. This is the kind of thing that we have to do all the time, like in the real world. So you're doing a laboratory experiment, uh, and you're working with this compound over here. This is one naphthol. And you, if this is a you know real chemical, people actually use. It's an industrial feedstock for a lot of things. It's also uh, produced as a metabolite. And it's lots of lots of interesting stuff. Uh, so there's all kinds of reasons why you might be using this. And let's say you're doing your experiments in little serum bottles. You know, 20 milliliter serum bottles. So you have 20 milliliter aqueous samples. And at every time point in your in your reaction, you want to extract the naphthol out of the water into some sort of solvent so that you can then analyze it using gas chromatography. So you're given some choices of solvent, uh, and hexane, benzene, chloroform, ethyl acetate, and, and octanol. And you're given the log of the KLW, this is the liquid to water partitioning coefficient. So in, in, this, in the case of octanol, this is the log KOW, the octanol water partition coefficient, uh, and these are the same kind of coefficient but for other, other solvents. And uh, so you can look at these numbers, and the question is, which solvent should you use, and how much do you need to use if you want to get 99% extraction efficiency? Which is what we want, right? We want to get, y now, you, could you do the math for 100% extraction efficiency? The answer is no, because you need an infinite amount of solvent to get 100% extraction efficiency. But 99% extraction efficiency is totally achievable. And we'll talk about why in a minute. So. Uh, which of these solvents should you use, and how much sol how, which solvent and how much solvent do you need to get this to work properly? So first thing, okay, let's talk about this compound. So here's your naphthol. It's a it's a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon in a sense. It's got two fused benzene rings. It's basically naphthalene with an OH group on it. Uh, if we ignore this left hand ring, it's basically phenol. What do we know about phenol? Well, we know that phenols are some of the best hydrogen bonders in the world. They're very good at both donating and accepting a hydrogen bond, right? The hydrogen here can donate a hydrogen bond, and this oxygen has two lone pair electrons and can accept a hydrogen bond. So it has some hydrophobicity because of the two benzene rings, but it's also got some polarity because of the OH group, and it's got definite abilities to hydrogen bond, both accept and donate. So when we look at the solvents, the one with the lowest KLW here among the five is N-hexane, right? N-hexane is just a straight chain, six carbons, no OH groups, no polarity at all, and no ability to hydrogen bond. Benzene uh, is similar to the naphthol in the sense that it's got the aromatic structure. We know that aromatic rings have a very, very weak ability to accept a hydrogen bond. So maybe a little tiny, tiny bit of hydrogen bonding there, and maybe that's why benzene is more than an order of magnitude better as a solvent than hexane. Chloroform has a very, very weak ability to donate a hydrogen bond. I think we talked about that. Um, let me pull up the structure of chloroform here real quick, and, and I'll talk to you about why that is. Here's chloroform, right? So each of these three chlorines is withdrawing electron density away from this carbon and therefore also away from the hydrogen. And that leaves this hydrogen with a pretty substantial partial positive charge. And that means that it's a reasonable hydrogen bond donor. It's not great, but, but it's doable. It, it can donate a hydrogen bond a little bit. And so that explains why benzene and chloroform are both kind of in the, in the same boat here. Benzene can weakly accept and chloroform can weakly donate a hydrogen bond, and so both of them are doing better as extraction of solvents than N-hexane. Now, N that ethyl acetate is even better as a uh, hydrogen bond acceptor. So let's pull up ethyl acetate here. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. Boom, here's ethyl acetate. So lots of lone pair electrons. Two lone pair electrons on this oxygen, two lone pair electrons on this oxygen. So this is quite a good hydrogen bond acceptor, but not a donor. Because remember, when hydrogen is bonded to carbon, it's off the market, cannot hydrogen bond. Um, so those hydrogens are off the market, but the two oxygens are very good at ex ac accepting a hydrogen bond, and that explains why it has an even higher log KLW. And then, of course, octanol. I mean, hopefully you already know the structure of octanol. Let's pull that up again. Pull up 
what, what's, this is extremely boring, but you know, worth showing the, the, the image here. So here's your octanol, right? Just a long straight chain, but it's got the OH group on it. So octanol can both donate and accept hydrogen bonds. And so it's a good match for one naphthol, and that explains why it has the highest log KLW value. Okay, so just looking at the numbers, I mean, you don't have to do any math. You can just look at the numbers and say octanol is the best solvent. It's going to have the lowest amount of volume. You're going to need the smallest amount of volume to get 99% extraction efficiency of this chemical. But you also have to have a little practical knowledge here and realize that um, octanol is not a good solvent for gas chromatography. Precisely because it can both donate and accept a hydrogen bond, octanol is quite viscous and it has a high boiling point. And when you're doing gas chromatography, you need things to boil. You need to get them in the gas phase. So octanol is shown here mostly just as an example, uh, but in reality, it's probably not the best choice for a GC solvent. So that would move us down to the next best choice, which is probably ethyl acetate. Uh, so that's qualitatively the right answer. Yes, absolutely. Ethyl acetate is probably the best choice, but let's do the math and figure out how much volume of ethyl acetate I'm going to need to get 99% extraction efficiency. Uh, so here's our formula for F, which, what I'm calling F sub S, which is the fraction of the chemical that's in the solvent phase, right? So that's going to be the mass of the chemical that's in the solvent phase divided by the total mass. And in this case, we've only got two phases. We got the water and we got the solvent. So in the numerator, we have the mass that's in the solvent phase, which is the concentration in the solvent times the volume of the solvent. And the, de the denominator we have here, this is the mass in the solvent and plus the mass in the water, which is the concentration in the water times the volume of the water. And the trick here is to recognize that KLW can be expressed as the concentration in the solvent over the concentration in water. This looks terrible. Uh, but anyway, so knowing that, we could go up here and we could divide every term in this equation by CW so that, uh, you know, this becomes CS over CW. So we substitute in a KLW right here times the volume of solvent. Same thing in the denominator. And then over here, when we divide this CW by CW, it just disappears, right? They, they cancel each other out. And so we end up with this, this equation. And, you know, it's not a line. Right? I mean, you can look at that equation. It's very clearly not y equals mx plus b. This is not going to give us a line. Uh, so now we need to solve this for the volume of the solvent. And so I've just done some rearranging here and solved this equation for the volume of solvent. And so we can put this in here. And of course, the fraction in the solvent, f sub s, is 0.99, right? Because we want 99% extraction efficiency. So f sub s is 0.99. So you plug those numbers in here, and you're going to get uh, your make that a little bit bigger so you can see the formula. Plug that in here and you're going to get the amount of solvent needed and no surprise the amount of solvent needed goes down as the K sub L value goes up. So you need the lowest amount of volume for octanol uh, followed by ethyl acetate. So you need 5 milliliters of ethyl acetate to get 99% extraction efficiency out of 20 milliliters of water. That seems reasonable, right? I can deal with that. For chloroform you need 30 milliliters of chloroform to extract 20 milliliters of, of water. Well, so you're actually, your concentration is going to go down. Uh, that's not great. Benzene, about the same, 26 milliliters. And if you're going to use hexane, you need 600 milliliters of hexane to extract 20 milliliters of water. That doesn't make any sense. That's insane. So hexane, you, you, you'd, you'd go broke just buying hexane. This stuff is not cheap. So clearly, uh, ethyl acetate makes sense. I think 5 milliliters is a reasonable number. Um, and so you could do this plot here of the log KLW versus the volume of the solvent required to do the extraction. And that would give you, I believe it's this one. No, maybe not. Um, so we can just plot this. Insert. Nice plot here. And there we go. So the volume of the solvent that you need over here on the y-axis goes down as the log KLW value goes up. That's what you expect, right? That makes some sense. Okay, so uh, explain why. Well, as we've seen here, uh, you know, naphthol has the three different types of forces, van der Waals, polar, and hydrogen bonding, uh, and the octanol is the only one that can do a good job of both donating and accepting a hydrogen bond. But again, it's not the best choice because it's not a very good GC solvent, so ethyl acetate is going to win. 
Okay. Uh, next part of the question, what if you extract twice? If you extract twice, then in the first extract, you only need to get 90% recovery. Because in the second extract, you'll get another 90% of the remaining 10%, and you add those together, and you got a 99% extraction. Uh, and now, if this was a linear relationship, right, then it wouldn't matter. You would just, you know, you'd, you'd use, you'd basically just use um, half in the first extraction, half in the second extraction, and the total amount would be the same. But because it's nonlinear, it turns out it does, it does make a difference. So if the first extraction is only uh, the extraction efficiency is only 0.9 here instead of 0.99. Turns out the volume of solvent goes way down. If we need 99% extraction efficiency, we need 600 milliliters of n-hexane, but we only need about 50 milliliters of n-hexane if we're going to get 90% extraction efficiency. Then, of course, you have to double that because there's a second extraction, so now you're up to about 100 milliliters, but you're still well below the 600 you needed if you were just going to do a single extraction. And when you get to ethyl acetate, now you're down to only needing about a milliliter of solvent for every um, every time you run this experiment. So you've cut the amount of solvent you need to down by a factor of five. And again, that saves you money. So this is why people will often do two extractions, uh, saves money and, and is more efficient. And not only does it save money, but the, the same amount of mass of one um, naphthol is going to be dissolved in a smaller volume which means your concentration is higher, and that means you have better detection limits. You're more likely to be able to detect the naphthol when you do the, the injection. Um, so this is all good stuff. Makes a lot of sense. A uh, little bit mind-blowing. Um, but let's, uh, let's think about why. So I've done a plot over here. I hid it carefully from you. Now I'm going to reveal it. Okay, so I did this plot where I calculated the milliliters of solvent necessary to get what percent recovery, right? And this I did for chloroform. So if you look at the, the equation here, it's pointing to the KLW value of chloroform, but I could do it for w whichever one you want. And down over here is the plot that goes with that data. So again, very nonlinear. Um, so as the milliliters of chloroform increases, the extraction efficiency increases really dramatically in the beginning, but then it starts to level off, and it's essentially asymptotic to 100%, meaning you never get to 100%. You come close, but you don't ever get there, which is why we would never put a value of 1 in this equation, because then it would be 1 minus the fraction of solvent, which is 1. We'd get a 0 down here, and this thing blows up. You can't divide by 0. Uh, dividing by 0 essentially gives you infinity. So that's why we don't shoot for 100% extraction efficiency. And this curve here is what you might think of as like the law of diminishing returns, right? Think of this as, like you could think of this as your grade on the final exam, and this could be the number of hours you spend studying. You know, if you spend one hour of studying, you go from essentially a zero on the exam to maybe a 50 or 60%, and you're happy, right? You spend two hours of studying, and, and next thing you know, you're getting a B. You spend four hours studying, and you're getting an A. But if you want to get 100% on the exam, you have to study essentially forever. So somewhere between four hours of study and forever of study is, is your, your break period. That's, that's the break point where you say, okay, I've done enough. Um, doubling your effort going from one to two hours more than doubles your score. It has a dramatic increase on your score, but doubling your effort from two hours to four hours has a much smaller impact, right? So these are... The, you know, the trade-offs that you make. Okay, so that's extraction efficiency versus the milliliters of, of uh, extraction solvent. Again, we could draw this same plot for any one of these KLW values. Um, and what would happen is, as the KLW value gets better, so here I'll just, I'll just put in another value here. I'll put in, uh, you know, 800, which is basically the value for octanol, and watch what happens to this curve over here when I hit enter. It, it increases much more quickly because you need smaller volumes of solvent over here to get good extraction efficiency, but it still levels off and is asymptotic to 100%. So I'll hit undo here and go back to where we were. Okay, uh, and then there's a final question here. What if you add some salt? What if you add 3.56 grams of sodium chloride to the water sample before you do the extraction? Why would we do this? Well, we know that the salt has the salting out effect, and we can use the session out constant to predict the, the amount of that. Um, and so if you add salt, you're going to actually increase the KLW value, okay? 
and we know this, we, we saw the equation for this, this is the Sessionow equation, and the Sessionow constant for one naphthol is actually given in Table 5.7, Sessionow constant's 0.23, and it turns out that 3.56 grams of sodium chloride is, is all of the salt you can possibly dissolve in 20 milliliters of water. Um, you do the math here and it comes out to be about 3 molar sodium chloride. So that's the molarity you're going to fit into the Sessionow equation, and when you do that, you're going to get this equation. Remember this equation from the notes. Uh, the ratio of the KO, I'm using KOW here, but it could be any KLW in the presence of salt divided by KLW with no salt is equal to 10 times K to KS times the salt concentration in molar units. So we can use that equation, we can plug this in here, so this is the KLW when there is no salt, and here's the KLW in the presence of salt. Again, here's my equation, make this a little bit wider so you can see it better. There's the equation, so that's the original KLS, B79, times 10 to the value of 0.23, which is the Sessionow constant, times 3.05 moles per liter of sodium chloride. So in this case, because we've really loaded the system up with salt, uh, our KLS, uh, LW value has gone up by a lot, right? So we can, we can just take the ratio of these two and we can see it's gone up by about a factor of five, right? Um, so remember when we were doing the problem in the Arctic Ocean, we said that the ocean is 0.5 molar salinity and at a KL, KS value of 0.25, I think we had a 33% increase in Henry's Law. But here we have much more salt, you know, now we're up to three molar salt and now we have a five-fold increase in KLW because of the salt. Uh, and so because KLW increases by a factor of five, the amount of solvent you need decreases by about a factor of five. So we go from one milliliter of, or excuse me, needing five milliliters of ethyl acetate up here to now only needing one milliliter of ethyl acetate. If we extract twice, excuse me, if we extract once, if we extract twice, we need even less. Okay, so this is if you do the extraction twice. So adding salt can force the chemical, basically squeezes the chemical out of the aqueous phase and into the solvent. All of this is based on the assumption that the salts do not dissolve into the solvent at all. Eh, might, it may be not a perfect assumption, but not bad. Good enough for what we're doing. Um, so anyway, that's the point, that the, the chemical you can, there's a couple of different ways to skin this cat, right? You pick the right solvent, you could extract twice. Uh, you know, adding the salt, uh, that gets expensive. This is a lot of salt, but uh, if you're really having a hard time getting a good extraction efficiency, and this is a very difficult system, that might be something to investigate. Maybe you don't need to add the full 3.56 grams of sodium chloride. Maybe you could add a smaller amount and still get the extraction efficiency to where you need it to be. But there are, these are the levers you can pull. You can choose your solvent, you can choose the amount of solvent, you can choose to extract twice, maybe even three times if you think it'll help. Uh, you can add uh, salt. There's a couple things that you can do to try to increase your extraction efficiency. So your homework problem is to do basically the same thing except for your chemical, whatever your chemical might be. And of course the answer is going to be very different depending on what kind of chemical you have. If your chemical is completely nonpolar, you might find that N-hexane is the best solvent. But if it does have any hydrogen bonding ability, probably one of these guys is going to be the best choice. So good luck with that, and I'll see you on the other side.